Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome. Welcome to uh, Book Passage. And uh, thank you for joining us. We know you have a lot of in this uh, kind of world that's no longer new, a uh, year and a half old now of a lot of uh, virtual events. We know you have choices and we certainly do not take that for granted. And that's why Book Passage likes to bring you some of the most unique and best that you'll find. Tonight's not gonna disappoint. Um, and welcome, I'm your host Paula Farmer with Book Passage. Um, I am so thrilled with this in conversation author coupling. And I know because of who they are and what they've written, but also but how it came together, it was meant to be. And I have no doubt that it will end up being one of the best of book, of book passage history. And I'm so excited and you will be too. First up is uh, our featured author and her book, Julie Lifcott Haynes. She is truly a friend to the store. Uh, we had had um, her in events in one form of another or another uh, for several years, many, many events. And as an event host and moderator, she is the author that I have worked with the most. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, yes, nice. I would oh, say definitely the most. That. Uh, with Ayad Akhtar coming in a close second. I think he thinks I'm stalking him. Um, so, but I'll tell you what, Julie probably thinks I'm stalking her too, but that's okay. I'm a fan. She's an exceptional nonfiction writer um, and her books are always insightful and engaging and her, per, uh, her presentations are just as dynamic as her writing. Um, her titles include New York Times bestseller, How to Raise an Adult, Break Free from the Parenting Trap and Prepare Your Kids for Success. Real American, a powerful memoir about race, identity, and community as she navigated uh, her world in, as a biracial woman growing up in white spaces. And her latest book, Your Turn, How to Be an Adult. Uh, it is, I believe, also New York Times bestseller garnering a lot of attention not yet, country. but maybe because you said so, it will Yes, be. yes, I'm calling it. <laughs> and uh, it's an inspiring book to people of all ages, um, but obviously there's a definite appeal to college age and post-college and the parents of college students and all that. And it's very inspiring as far as how for them to kind of find their footing in the world and keep moving on. Um, joining her in conversation is Peggy Orenstein, an equally impressive nonfiction writer who has also done several book passage events over the years and always drawing big crowds. Um, her New York Times best-selling books include um, Boys and Sex, Girls and Sex, and Cinderella Ate My Daughter, so also a parenting and adulting theme. They're going to be great. You're going to be so glad you joined us. And right now I'm going to turn it over to Peggy and Julie. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all so much for joining us. And I'm really thrilled to be here. I feel like, Julie, your books have been following, helping me on my parenting journey. I now have, I am in your sweet spot. I have a daughter who is going off to college this fall. And these are all the issues I'm grappling with. So I am so grateful that you have written this book. Thank you for doing it for me. Oh yes, 100%. And thank you for writing your books for me. I love how frank you are, how you don't flinch around the tough nitty gritty subjects we all need to be talking about, but many people can't, won't, don't, or are ashamed about. You've just got this clarity, this like, yo, this is the deal, let's talk. And I try to be that way too. I, I, as a nonfiction writer like you, I think I try to tell the truth as much as I can bear it because mm -hmm. that's when we connect with each other and we demystify things and we feel belonging and less alone. So I'm really grateful that you agreed to be in convo with me here at the amazing book passage tonight, Peggy. Thank you. Sure. I got to say, I, you know, when Paula said I'd done a few events, I've been doing events at book passage since 1990. 
three, I want to say, with my first one, maybe 1994. Long time. That's so, I was on my first career then. I was still in law school then. I've been a lawyer and a dean and now a writer since then. I'm brand new to writing, relatively speaking. Amazing that you've been with them for so long. I know. So obviously, um, your turn um, springs from your previous book, uh, from, from How to Raise an Adult. And um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, other than the fact that I'm sure there was sort of an obvious like, hey, you did this book, now do this book, sort of imperative. Um, why, why, what, what compelled you to write this book? Well, I think in some ways, this is the book that um, lives um, at the center of why I wrote the first book. So the first book is on the harm of overparenting. Was I a parenting expert? Hell no. I was a college dean rooting for young adults to make it in this one wild and precious life. There were a lot of parental behaviors that, are, that were interfering with young people having agency and resilience, kind of walking down the path of life or making their own path. So I wrote a book about a problem that was impeding the progress of young adults. This book is me directly to the young adults saying, I'm rooting for you. It's terrifying, it's hard, but it's also delicious and amazing. You'll want to, let's go. You use that word delicious a lot. I do. Yeah, I like that word. Is that what, what for you, what does that bring I up? I think it was trying to find the antithesis to terror. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, it's terrifying at times. And it, to be an adult is to be more or less responsible for yourself. Whereas in childhood, you're more or less the responsibility of others. I mean, that's the, that's the big divide. And yeah, it comes with some terror, but I was trying to counterbalance the terror. It wasn't just terror and joy. I wanted to go bigger than joy mm -hmm. or more visceral than joy. So that's where I grabbed delicious from. You know, I, I was thinking that at one time and, and you, you just said that like more, maybe more in my parents' generation, there were these markers there's sort of at least for some people an agreed upon checklist of what constituted adulthood like you went to school you got married you bought it you got or you got a job you got married you had you had kids you bought a house um and and there were these things these sort of milestones these sort of communal stepping stones and that's really changed i, I don't feel like anything is really um you know, it's incumbent upon us at this point. So how, how do you know if you're an adult? What, what does that mean right now? Yeah, those old definitions were very gendered and very hetero. Let me yeah. just put in that. A woman went from being the property of her father to being the property of her husband mm -hmm. in an era where everybody was presumed to be straight and, uh, and you didn't have a choice as a woman. That's what you had to do. You were a spinster, air quotes, if you weren't married by 27, I think, or younger. Um, so boy, have things changed. So what does it mean to be an adult when the old definition seems inadequate to the present, to define the present moment? Uh, and ad adulting is this set of sweet decades, we hope, when you are, as I've said, more or less responsible for yourself. So you go from being in the care of others at this end of life, the start of life, to the care of others as you near the end of life, unless death comes suddenly, you're once again, typically in the care of people who are more hale and hearty and capable than you. And these adulting years, it's not to say you're not an adult at the end of life, but my point is these years in between are years of great capacity to do for yourself. You got to make, you got to deal with the fending, I call it. Bills, belongings, body. These are the basics. Just you walk, you wake up and know it's pretty much on me to get myself through my day, take care of business. You're not alone. You have to have humans. Humans are key, but you're not reliant upon humans for your constant care. And um, that's what adulting is as at its most basic. Of course, it gets very existential. Who am I? Why am I on the planet? What do I want out of this life? It's up to me is one of the dominant messages in this book. Forget what everyone else is telling you, you need to do to appease them or meet with their applause and approval. This is your one wild and precious life. I quote Mary Oliver in this book. And, or if I don't quote her in the book, I'm constantly quoting her whenever I speak about the book. Um, this is your one wild and precious life. Yo, it's on, let's go. Come on, this is awesome. Is, is, is there a reason why 
I mean, adulting has become kind of a, a, a verb as opposed to adulthood. Is that different? Well, millennials did that. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly when, but I want to say at least 12 years ago, maybe 15 now older millennials were emerging into adulthood and they were saying, I don't know how to adult. I don't want to adult. Adulting is scary. And um, some people get annoyed at the grammatical, uh, you, you know, misstep, mm -hmm. but I'm here with tremendous compassion for any young adult, let alone an entire generation that seems to feel inadequate at entering a phase of life prior generations more or less didn't think about even, okay, I'm an adult now, or gleefully entered, like, yes, I'm finally in charge, get away from me, stop, you know, like, it's on me. I'm, I'm so intrigued by what we've done in, in our neighborhoods, in our families, in our schools, in our communities more broadly, in our countries, such that an entire generation is like, ah, uh, not so sure I can, not so sure I want to, this looks terrifying. I think we've made childhood too cushy and comfortable and in some ways have dulled that impulse to leave the nest and be out there and fly and deal. You know, I think that's a piece of it, the overparent, not to say every young adult who struggles with adulting has been overparented, but there's, you know, the, one of the big questions in this book is why are you stuck? And I don't put the blame on the kids. I lay it at the feet of, you know, these broader things, family, society, the zeitgeist um, that has made somehow childhood and being, you know, sort of on the shoulder, carried on the hip of, held by the hand of someone else more attractive than being this metaphorically speaking, freestanding adult. Maybe we kind of took attachment parenting too, too far Maybe. sort of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny though. I think when I think about myself, um, hopefully this is not TMI, but uh, I think that, well, two things. One was my parents completely didn't prepare me to be an adult in any way, shape or form. I was utterly, utterly ill-equipped in all of the ways that you've written about um, for kind of sexist and cultural reasons, I think. Um, but also as somebody who then was rebelling against convention and coming into feminism and wanting to carve my own path, I also really hated the idea of adulthood because to me it, it it represented this very conventional staid thing that I didn't want anything to do with. So I wonder if there were if there have been other ways that sort of adulthood has gotten sort of a, a, a bad rap or if there's a way that you know there, there, there's a rebellion against convention that comes with refusing to adult. Mm, I really like that. Um, it's really a great question. A rebellion against convention, um, yeah. And I think there are a lot of uh, truths to the notion that it's much harder to adult in a financial sense these days, mm -hmm. because in a macroeconomic sense, wages and salaries have not kept up with cost of living. Add to that the fact that millennials have more student loan debt from college than any prior generation by huge amounts. So wages and salaries are low, debt is higher. They can't afford a one bedroom apartment in the Bay Area. How crazy is that? You know, there was a time when the minimum wage meant a, a, a wage that could support a man, his wife and their child. It's absurd to think that the minimum wage could support three people, even in places where it has become a living wage as communities like yours and mine have fought for that $15 an hour still doesn't mean you can afford, still is not enough to pay for a one bedroom apartment in my town. So what are people supposed to do? Of course they have to live at home. doesn't mean they're weak or lazy or there's anything wrong with them as a generation or as an individual. Things are broken. And the millennial generation gets that better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, did you see that piece today uh, in the Times um, that women are, that there's a, just a birth rate, we're having a baby bust? I saw the headline, have not read the article. Tell me about it. Okay, I also just saw the headline. I didn't read oh. the article. But, I, but I, I thought that that was part of this, that, you know, what, how could you possibly have children when you can't even, you know, afford, afford rent? It just, it, there's sure. some, you know, sure. 
and that speaks to the socioeconomic that that's the economic piece of it but it also speaks to choice and that's an upside here we have in our 21st century milieu for people of all genders far more choice than we've had before i mean i don't need to tell you this but i'm trying to tell viewers this we have a choice about whether to have a child or not largely it's up to our bodies and our bank accounts i mean what we can afford and what we choose okay we have choices. We don't have, we can have a baby without a partner. We can have a partner without a baby. We can have neither. We can have both. These choices were not available to our mothers and certainly not to our grandmothers. And so I know anecdotally, plenty of people are saying, I'm not going to have a baby. I'm not sure I want to be a parent. Maybe that's not a life that looks attractive to me. You know, maybe who knows what that's a function of. Um, and as individuals, we're not concerned about birth rate and, you know, whether we're going to replace our population. That's a, that's a sociological problem. Many of us as individuals do not feel an obligation to repopulate the country or the planet. We're sort of like no handmaid's tale for me. Thank you very much. I've got my career. Maybe I have some people in my life I'm close to relationally in terms of a primary or number of primary relationships. Maybe I don't want to have kids and that's perfectly fine. And my book certainly validates those choices to the extent they are choices. You know, one thing that I loved about the book um, as the mother myself of a daughter who is biracial, bisexual, neuroatypical, um, is that you bring a diverse perspective um, that, that, that you've not only, I mean, uh, just kind of across the board. And, and I'm sure that as a woman of color, that was very important to you, but um, there's also diversity in terms of socioeconomic class, um, in terms of mental health issues, all these different things. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, Peggy, I'm a 53 year old black biracial woman, cisgender, uh, who was raised in white spaces. Uh, my life was transgressive from the start. My black father and white mother had the audacity to fall for each other and commit to it and get married by the state and have me I was not contemplated. My existence is outside the lines. And I was given that message repeatedly from as far back as age four, I can remember being otherized, being regarded with scrutiny because my skin color and hair texture were out of bounds. And I think that that truth animates my interest in all of us. I have a certain, I am also bisexual. I identify as queer. I'm in a heterosexual marriage or a marriage to a cisgendered man who also identifies as bi 33 years and going. I can deal with these complexities. I love myself as I am. I can say that after decades of not loving myself because I was taught something was wrong with me. So as the author of a nonfiction self-help book, you can be damn sure I'm going to try to signal to readers, whomever they are. I had you in mind when I wrote this book, this chapter, this page, this line. There are some lines in there that are carefully placed so somebody feels more seen than they're accustomed to feeling when they open a quote unquote mainstream book. I know what it's like to be otherized and I'm trying not only not to replicate the otherization, but to affirmatively be inclusive. I, my mantra here is all lives don't matter. All lives should matter if we want all lives to matter, particularly when we're writing nonfiction self-help, we ought to include, do our best to include all, particularly those who are typically in the margins, marginalized. My God, it's so literal. We ought to put the margins, the marginalized people on the center of the page. So this is my philosophy. And I've, I've tried to live up to it in how I wrote this book. You know, this is a little inside baseball as a writer, but I always struggle with um, naming identities when I write. And I have written books where I've thought, okay, I'm just going to call white people, white people. Like if anybody's white, they're going to be white because we always are naming other people and we don't name the white people. And my editor, you know, <laughs> It's like, 
you can't do that. And I said, well, then I'm going to take out all the other ones and then nobody's going to have anything. And then she said, well, then we don't know there's people of color in the book. And it, it's like, it's, it was such, I, I really struggle with that. And I wondered how you um, handle that as a writer. Keep fighting, Peggy. Keep fighting. Because if my editor had said that's me, I would have said that that's a non-starter for me. I'm not letting whiteness linger unnamed on the page as the presumed norm to which the rest of us are the other. I will not do that. And I've had those conversations. I've been with Bolt across my three books, tremendous people. I have had those conversations with them. I've had it around gender pronouns, back with how to raise an adult, arguing about, you know, I don't want to say hear her or S slash he. What about people who don't identify with either? Well, publishing protocols, ah, oh, fuck that. You know, I'm sorry. I shouldn't be swearing. I'm on YouTube right now. I guess you can swear on YouTube. Um, it's not like... <laughs> I'm in an elementary school, but man, this stuff is really problematic. So we have to shake the cages we're in. Genre is a cage. Pronouns are a cage. I'm here trying to shake the cages that we're in to say, open these doors. It's better with the doors open. Okay. So we have to have these arguments is my point. We have to be the ones to go to battle for the reader, not to feel so belittled. Here's what happens if you're a reader of color and you open a book and it's character A, you know, woke up and stretched his arms and looked out the window and felt, you know, God, I need some coffee. He encountered character B in the lobby of his hotel, gave him a smile. You know, character C was pushing her stroller down the road and he almost tripped over the toddlers who had dropped their sippy cup and and then he enters the coffee shop and character d um snapped her gum and her skin shone her brown skin i'm doing terrible writing but i'm trying to make the point her brown skin glistened in the light of the morning sun and she handed him his coffee latte we have learned the author thinks we don't we all know what the race of a b and c are we didn't need to mention race till d because d is of color that is like a conspiracy. The publisher and author think the reader knows, oh, I know the race of character A, B, and C. As a reader of color, when I find that happens and it happens constantly, I get incensed. I'm, I'm right back to the author in the page, assumes white, assumes white, assumes white. And, in a, and that's fiction. I just made that terrible fiction up. In a nonfiction sense, here's how I've seen it done. Let's talk about college admissions. Okay, college admissions, a book on college admissions, um, college admission preferences, they, this author will say, go to donor kids and legacy kids, parents who went to the school and NCAA athletes and underrepresented minority kids, black and brown, black and Latino native. And I have said to that author, oh no, you can't do all of that and only mention race here because guess what? This is whiteness and this is whiteness. And even NCAA athletes are mostly white, believe it or not. More scholarships go to white athletes than anyone else. So you've got to mention the race of the white donor kids and the white legacy kids and the white NCAA athletes if you're going to mention the black and brown. And to his credit, that author, when I gave him that feedback, was like, whoa, my gosh, you are so right. And he made those um, edits to his book. And that's the kind of activism I'm trying to practice around undoing the um, presumption that white is the norm and therefore does not need to be stated. I really appreciate that. That That is really, and I realize it's not exactly about your current book, but it is because you are writing from that. And it does make me wonder if you have any special advice for either um, BIPOC emerging adults or for their parents as they're going into this time is there is there something specific that you want to say oh wow um so huh. you know specific to BIPOC readers and their you know, young adults and their parents I think I would say not knowing beyond that title where they are coming from what their degree of education is socioeconomic status you know when you emerge out into the world of work or college or the military, which are basically your three choices out of high school, um, the world will behave as the world does. And whatever your home environment has been, um, I hope you have been unconditionally loved there and prepared for what the world might throw at you. Um, 
And you need to know that when stuff happens, it's not you. There is nothing wrong with you. You are worthy of being treated with dignity and kindness. And the older you get, the more you will intentionally, you should intentionally choose to be in places where you can be cherished as you are, as opposed to tolerated for your differences. And I would say that to queer kids. And I would say that to trans kids. And I would say that to Muslim kids. And I would say that to anybody who is different than the majority in the environment they find themselves in. That self-love is going to get you through finding mentors and peers who are like you and can relate to you. Also key. And then this gets broader. You should choose not just to be where you can be cherished, but study what you love. Choose work you love and you're good at. You're not here to be a dog in a dog show or a dog on a leash, you know, just being marched down the path of life according to someone else's whims. This is profoundly, deeply, intimately, personally your life, not mine, not theirs. I don't care how much money they've spent on you. You should not be a whatever to please someone else. And those are the big conversations I'm trying to um, spur by writing this book. The universal discussion too. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if there's, um, are there chapters or individual stories that you feel that really are sort of like the ones that most touch your heart and most animate you um, or, or, you know, that you feel the most strongly about? It's an enormous book because adulting is many, many decades of life, we hope, and it can't be boiled down. And I refuse, refused the temptation to trivialize any of it. Um, the form is some self-help lists because some people learn that way and some people want that. Some stories from my own lived experience, a lot of me vulnerably sharing in a memoiristic sense, stuff I've experienced lessons are deduced. And then these stories of these third parties who have you, as you've acknowledged, come from all of these walks of life. Um, Cause I'm trying to illustrate there's no one way and stories are the way humans have taught humans how to be human since we had language. And um, so when it comes to my favorites chap, there's 13 chapters, chapter five was actually my way into the book, Peggy. I had tried and failed to write this book for about two and a half to three years. I kept coming up with stuff that was rejected from the publisher. Didn't like the voice, didn't agree with the content. And I was just tearing my hair out. And then finally, I figured out how to be my former college dean self in office hours on the page. I tried to summon my memory of being a dean at Stanford, talking to undergraduates, trying not to answer their questions, but to open them further to their own wants by asking good questions back. When I summoned that, self, which, you know, I haven't been on that campus as a dean since 2012, but the memories are fresh. And I just thought, let me write, let me see if that'll work. That's the chapter called Stop Pleasing Others. They have no idea who you are. And it's about college and majors and work and identity. And so other writers would have broken those up into three different chapters, college, you know, college and what to study, work, what to do, identity, who to be. For me, it's all giving yourself permission to make these big, big decisions, to be in charge, to be in the driver's seat. That's why they all go together. And that is my favorite chapter because it's the through line from the deaning, which was why I wrote the first book, right? All the way through now into this book. And I have other favorite chapters. I mean, I love, um, I love the relationships chapter. Chapter seven, start talking to humans. Humans are, sorry, start talking to strangers. Humans are key to your survival. This is me taking a childhood norm and turning it on its head. This book explicitly does that. Perfect, great job, buddy. You slid down the slide. Perfect, you drew a drawing. That's how millennials have been raised. And chapter three is you're not perfect. You're here to learn and grow. And I'm in your face about that because those norms have harmed them. They have become perfectionistic people afraid to talk to strangers because we've said, don't talk to strangers. Afraid of disappointing. Right? You make the case also about the fear of disappointing. Yeah, of disappointing. absolutely. Can you tell some yeah. stories about yourself. Can you tell some stories, some stories about your own, your law school experience, your with the moving van? Which law school experience? Just recognizing that you were sort of on a path that was not the right path. Oh, I see. Yes. Um, 
yeah, so I was this young woman of color. I graduated Stanford uh, with a degree in American studies, headed to law school to try to be like Thurgood Marshall and uh, our nation's first black Supreme Court justice who litigated Brown versus Board of Education. I wanted to be the type of lawyer who was going to make such a difference in the lives of people underserved and marginalized by this country. I wanted to be that type of lawyer. The trouble is I was so insecure when I was in law school as a young woman of color at an elite law school, Harvard. Um, I came out of law school clutching an offer to go work for a Silicon Valley law firm because I knew my peers, my school, society, it seemed everybody, air quotes, valued the corporate path. So I needed to prove to them that I have the intellectual chops to garner this offer from a prestigious law firm. So off I went to be a Silicon Valley litigator at the dawn of the commercialized internet. And I was now saving, protecting trademarks instead of protecting people, which is why I had gone to law school. I was miserable, Peggy. I was well-paid, the people were kind, they were mentoring me well, giving me opportunity, and I was seemingly good at it. And all of that, did not make up for the fact that I was in the wrong place. I had gone to law school to help people and was now protecting intellectual property. So I had this hole inside of me or a knot inside of me and I couldn't make sense of it because I had done everything right or so I thought. So how with all of this education, all of this privilege, how was I so freaking miserable? Oh, well, I was good at it, but I didn't love it. And that's when I learned, hey, if you're good at it and you if you're good at it but don't love it you will feel like a robot in your life you will feel like a drone just going through the motion sent by someone else to do a job doesn't matter how good you are at it if you don't love it doesn't matter how much money it is in fact often they pay you the big dollars cuz the work itself isn't nourishing you have to also love it and i did this little brainstorming exercise with myself on my back porch in Menlo Park in 1995, nine months into practicing corporate law. I had high blood pressure at work and a knot in my stomach every Sunday because my body by then was already saying, we don't like this. This is not why you're here. And I brainstormed with myself one night, what am I good at and what do I love? My intuition told me work should be the Venn diagram overlap of those two things. And that's what led me to become a university administrator to try to, to I, I admitted to myself, I'm a people person as much as I'm trying to be this analytical left brain person. And I think I do have some talent there. And yet I care deeply about the ooey gooey stuff, the soft skills, we now call it the emotional intelligence, we might say. I was that person, but didn't know that those were valid things related to work. And I gave myself permission only once I was miserable to lean into the possibility of a career helping people. I, and I think that's so interesting because I, I, I think that when we are good at something, we have a tendency to think we ought to do that because yeah. you're good at it, you know? And, and it's, it, there is a real difference between what you're good at can be a big difference between what you're good at and what you enjoy, love, feel passion about, um, yeah. devote your life to. And that's a really important lesson to learn. And societies over here often in the form of the media, your perception of what people think, your extended family, your immediate family, your friends, often saying, oh, you don't want to do that. That's easy. For example, psychology. So many Stanford students love the field of psychology, really dig it, and are told by the engineering kids, oh, that's easy. Oh, that's simple. Oh, of course. Often when we're good at it and love it, we're ridiculed. We're told it's not important enough or rigorous enough, or people with our degree of intellect shouldn't settle for something like this. Oh, you don't want to be a third grade teacher. Go be a college professor. You want to teach? Those two things are no way similar. You, oh, you don't want to be a nurse or an EMT. No, no, no. You want to be a doctor. You have, look, I'm not here to tell anybody that they should be a doctor instead of a nurse or a college professor instead of a K-12 teacher you know, or anything over anything. If a kid is from a family of lawyers hell bent on them being the next and they want to be a wilderness naturalist, I'm going to be rooting for that to happen just as I'm going to root. What? Did you meet my parents? I can 
family of lawyers. <laughs> I'm going to root for the kid who grew up in a family of theater artists who wants to go to Wall Street and be a banker. I'm rooting for that too. I'm rooting for the individual to become who they know deep inside themselves if they will just listen to the self. I'm rooting for that person to be who they know they are. It's lovely. I, I apologize for my dog. I don't know if you can hear her. She's oh, out there. No worries. Um, uh, you know, that, that just um, knocked me off of my, um, but yeah, I think that, that you know, the, the discussion of the fear of disappointing, and I wonder, you know, it seems, again, linking that to your pre, to um, how to raise an adult, it's that idea, I think, that that kids learn or have learned that you were saying in that book that you have to hit all these externalized marks, that there are these things that you must do in order to get into these good colleges, in order to do all, you know, the, uh, this this whole path that you get put on that you don't necessarily have the opportunity to question or choose. Um, and that doesn't leave you equipped then to question or choose a path for yourself. Absolutely right. Yeah. Um, so, and, and that, you know, leads me to the, another thing that you talk about, which is um, being good enough as you are. And um, that can sound kind of without context, a little bit hokey or a little bit like, what do you mean you're good enough as you are? You're just sitting on the couch, you know, no, you should be striving to, but, but it's a really important concept to understand as, as an adult. And I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Well, I think I'm saying it in response to the notion that you're supposed to be this profession, study this thing, love this person, that somebody else's definition of success is, is what matters. I reject that. Um, I know from having made terrible choices in my life and wonderful choices in my life, you know, having moved from the innocence of childhood into self-loathing, into a place of self-love, self-loathing when I was just trying to be what other people valued and now self-love. I know that success should be an internally derived um, understanding. I am successful because I know who I am and I am being that person. I'm getting better at being that person. I'm not rooting for complacency, sitting on the couch, not doing anything that leads to malaise and depression. We need to move our minds and our bodies. We need to create with our hands or our brains or our bodies to feel a sense of satisfaction. We want to work. We humans, homo sapiens, we want to connect with one another. We want to be in relationship. All of these things are very hardwired. And when we don't, we start to feel you know, less well. And so this isn't about you do you, you're fine, just sit on the couch. This is you do you, figure you out and go be that person and sharpen those whatever is the tools or the ways. You know, if you come to my backyard here in Palo Alto, now that that's possible, and we have some drinks and I light the gas fire pit, I'm going to ask, who are you becoming? My premise is we're all learning and growing until we take our last breath. I sure am because I don't want the opposite, which is I'm done. I'm good. I'm complacent. I don't want to be one of those people on Wally's spaceship, just sitting there going through the, just like having to be propelled through life. No, I'm hungry to learn and grow. And I presume you are too. So who are you becoming? Mm -hmm. Meaning not what title do you want next or what salary or where, you know, the house you want. No, what are you working on in terms of your own growth? I, for example, as everyone listening knows, I'm an extrovert. I don't have trouble hogging the space. I could talk forever. I work at listening. I work at making room for introverts, for example. I work at undoing my implicit biases against various people because we all have biases and I've been informed of that and I'm not okay with that and I want to be better than that. Those are two examples of my current practice around growth. And I offer and submit that we all should be interested in that, not complacent couch sitting, but actively becoming the best version of ourselves according to our own definition. So all of that, I mean, that's all about character. It's all about internal work. You also talk in the book about, you know, there's a lot that's about sort of the, the practicalities. You talk about, and you mentioned this earlier, fending for yourself is a big definition of adulthood. I, I want to tell you, I always thought the definition of adulthood was making your own dentist appointment. That's okay. if you're willing to make your own dentist appointments, you're an adult. Um, you talk about money and yeah. you talk about um, taking care of your body. And I wondered, you know, 
so so I want to make sure that people know that there's these that 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 these things are are in there and discussed in the same beautiful way you've just been talking about this. Um, but I was wondering how you feel like the you know inevitably how you feel like the pandemic has affected emerging adults' ability to adult to become adults and what what happens now. Anecdotally, I've seen two different things happen. One is young adults who uh, came back, say they were in the workplace or college. Um, came back home. Um, some were treated like they were kids again, and they settled into that childhood bedroom, childhood behaviors, parents treating you like a child, and they regressed. Some adult, young adults came back into that very same home and maybe childhood bedroom, but showed up saying, I don't know, I'm used to having responsibility out there. I'm used to having freedom and independence. I'm used to having accountability. I'm used to being able to make my own decisions and I'm still that person. The pandemic doesn't change that. And so they behaved in a more adult manner in this old familiar place. And they said, oh, hey, I'm gonna, why don't I go get the groceries because it's safer for me out there apparently than y'all because you're older. Let me pick up a meal or two that I can make or be responsible for. You know, they showed up and then they behaved that way. And the parents were agape, like, wow, look how grown they are. And they earned, you know, that more, that greater respect, greater ability to draw boundaries about what they would and would not do. They were effectively like an Airbnb guest who was very kind and loving in the house of their parents, you know, mutuality and individuality, that sort of interdependence, but also, you know, those good boundaries around my life, your life. So that pandemic wasn't inherently forcing you in either direction. It was sort of more a function of your relationship with the people who'd raised you that determined where you're going to fall into camp A or camp B. The pandemic has given all of us opportunities to develop skills and resilience. The resilience can be developed by simply looking back and saying, oh, that was some shit. You know, let me take stock of what I did manage to do when everything fell apart. Maybe I can say, you know what? that all fell apart, but I'm proud I stuck with this one class or things at school went awry, but I'm proud I was able to show up and support my younger siblings because my parents couldn't because they were both essential workers or, you know, family life was bad, but you know what? I managed to be the one to connect with an elderly neighbor. I was their only human, con you know, whatever, like notice whatever it was. And maybe it's multiple things that you managed to do and be in charge of despite it all and let that memory come back up to your consciousness, acknowledge it, be proud of yourself. That will be the set of memories that you call upon the next time something bad happens in 2025, when we're like, Oh my gosh, some new disaster. We'll be like, well, in the pandemic, here's how I took care of business. Mm -hmm. And this was also a year when so many other things were going on and struggles around systemic racism, um, polarizing politics, uh, fears about the future of the planet um, for those of us in the Bay Area living in the fires. And I've really seen in the communities of young people that I'm in that these events are, are they're, they're changing them. Um, they're changing who they are. They're changing how they think and how they relate. And I wonder how you think that is playing into their sense of themselves as adults or what happens to them as adults. There's something in the water. There's something in the air. Or maybe it was just the kindergarten active shooter drills to which Gen Z has been exposed from the beginning. I mean, imagine that Peggy, neither you nor I had active shooter drills K through 12, but our children have, it's just become normal. And Gen Z isn't having any of it. Gen Z is leading us around climate change and around gun violence and around systemic racialized violence and around treating every freaking person with the respect and dignity they're due with our language and with our behaviors. And I'm not trying to romanticize Gen Z, but I am here as a Gen Xer saying, you go kids, I am here to stand alongside you because I admire you and I will be here with you and try to help you do what you're trying to do because you might not yet have access to all the resources you need, although they're of course much more technologically able than any of the rest of us. So they have so much more power um, in their hands, literally. and. So what I see when I look at them and when I listen to them, when I go to their rallies and I go to their events, I hear a clear sense of what matters, a clear sense of sort of that idealistic conviction about the way the world should be, 
but also because of their technological ability, they're more capable of getting news out, of disrupting something, of making and breaking things. Um, then has been the case, I think, since the 60s when young adults all of a sudden define teenager, what it means to be a young adult. You know, like we're going to speak, question authority, all of that. I see that happening. I think it's interesting to watch millennials get bewildered by Gen Z's. Like, who are these young people? And why are they somehow, why are we worried about what they think of us instead of them worried about what we think of them, which is usually the way it goes. So there's something captivating about them, um, about the youngest and that, you know, they're not, they're barely crossing a threshold into adulthood, Gen Z, um, depending on how you define generations. Um, so um, I think I'm, I can't remember how you phrase the question. What do I think of them? Am I inspired by them? What's the, no, I, I mean, but clearly, yes. Um, no, I, I just wonder how you thought that would frame their transition to adulthood. Or maybe it's about, you know, I think part of adulthood, and you talk about this, is, is finding meaning, right? Yeah. Meaning yeah, absolutely. So what I'm hearing from them is I'm thrilled to know there's not one path. Many have been raised with this lockstep checklisted childhood. I call it do this, do this, do this, do this to please all of these other people. And my book, makes the case there isn't a path therefore there is no right path you're not on the wrong path okay there's just i reject the concept i reject keep your options open because that comes with implicit judgment from the person saying it oh, i don't like that option you're about to pick keep your options open so what i'm hearing from them is this book is a relief it's telling me the struggle is normal there's nothing wrong with me to feel struggle it is a wide open landscape and that is daunting, but it makes clear there isn't a path that I'm failing to be on. I'm hearing this relief around the normalcy uh, of being daunted by how big it all is. And yet I'm hearing relief at an invitation forward, therefore try anything, start anywhere. All of it will be data for you to learn more about yourself. And um, so that's what I'm, what I'm hearing, which is fantastic. And now what about, um, and I want to encourage people to um, put, uh, to ask questions um, because we have plenty of time for those. Um, and Zach's going to put them in the chat, I think. Um, what about relationships? What about, you know, we, you talked a little bit about talking to strangers. Um, what about connecting as a friend? What about connecting as a loving partner, sexuality, um, you know, what's your advice around that? Yeah, so one piece of advice, I'm just reaching for this book because ugh, on my shelf, David Brooks's Road to Character just fell on the floor. <laughs> um, this book, Friendship by Lydia Denworth is the basis for my relationships chapter. I felt the need to cite some research as the underpinning of a chapter that basically is saying, humans are everything. You need humans. You want humans. You got to figure out how to be with humans. You got to learn how to communicate and cooperate and commiserate. And um, what's it called? When you share, I've lost the other C word. <laughs> when you share, each one gets something. Uh, <laughs> vocabulary quiz. Oh no. We'll come back to it. Yeah, well, we'll, everyone knows what I'm talking about. Right, all of these things like humans are key. And there's research that makes clear that as primates, homo sapiens, like other primates are incredibly social species, um, cooperate. Maybe I already said that. Okay, yeah. compromise, that's it. Um, and so I, I, uh, I'm drawing people um, toward the deliciousness of being in community, friendship, relationship, partnership, bed with, other humans. And by bed, I mean beyond hookups. I mean the deliciousness of having a person or persons with whom there is this shared um, bond, this int intimacy, this knowing, this, you know, this deep trust and care. So that chapter traces humans from strangers to, you know, coworkers to neighbors to friends. And I just sort of deepen. Um, the relationship as we go through the chapter, ultimately ending with me and my own partner and the ways in which we have worked, despite the challenges that come with having kids and having careers and life happening, 
worked at staying connected and demonstrating how it is the smallest moments of, I see you, I see you, I will wait for you, I am here, acknowledging that life will get in the way, but this commitment can last if we work on it. Mm -hmm. I think I don't say this in the book, but I should have something like relationships are like plants. They need to be watered. They need the sun. They need the nutrients, whatever they need, they need. And without them, they will wither. You know, a relationship is not a couch sitting there. You know, a relationship is a living thing and it needs attention. Yeah. I, I love the, the part in the book where you talk about that list that you keep with your husband of, yeah. um, yeah. Well, it's a little sign we pass back and forth in the bathroom, a little dry erase sign and we write on it and he'll write me something and, and put it on my side of the bathroom and I'll look at it and appreciate it. And the next day or the next moment or a week or two later, I'll wipe it off with my hand and write something for him. And we have traded that thing over a thousand times easily um, over the course of probably 15 years at this point. Mm -hmm. Before texts. Yeah. It's the pretext way. Yeah, of definitely. Um, and in re when we're talking about relationships, what about with your parents? How do you establish a healthy relationship with your parents as an adult? And how do we as parents establish a healthy relationship with our kids? I mean, I always think about, you know, now how, how we talk, people talk to their kids, like, you know, all day long, kind of, whereas yeah. when I was, went to college, I said goodbye to my parents. I'll see you in several months. And I'll talk to you once a week for a few minutes on the landline and, you know, I don't know if that was better, but well, and, and that wasn't a choice that wasn't, I mean, it wasn't relationship driven. That was technology driven. You couldn't, you didn't have a phone in your pocket. Um, long distance, as we called it to call home was expensive. It was cheaper on the weekends. That's what we all did. It was just how things were done. Now we can talk constantly by text. And so we do. And the question is, I think within the context of technology enables it, what's healthy, what yeah. should we do? And I advise parents, you know, who are launching a kid out, say out of high school this summer into whatever awaits, sit down with them, be intentional with a smile on your face. Say, Hey kid, this is awesome. You've finished high school. You're headed out to whatever military college, grad, um, community college, gap year, workplace, whatever it is. We want to acknowledge you're an adult now, you know, you're no longer a little kid. You're, you, you have the right to so many more freedoms and independence and responsibility comes with that. Let's talk about how prepared you feel. What are some things we're doing for you that we need to teach you to do for yourself? It doesn't happen like that. We need to teach you. We're here for that. Let's drop a list. What's on your mind when I say those things? Pause, wait, let the kids speak. And I would say also, let's talk about how we'll communicate when you move on. Right now we do this constantly. You could be upstairs and I'm texting you. You know, I, I know where you are. I know where that should change. You're, you're going to have more privacy now as you move into adult life. You don't know everything that goes on in my life. I shouldn't know everything that goes on in yours. It's healthy to have a different set of boundaries now that you're moving into adult life. So let's talk what feels good in terms of the frequency of our communication. I tend to recommend Peggy once a week, a family video chat, you know, Zoom, FaceTime, whatever you want to use. So you can see their face and hear their voice because you know best what they look and sound like. And you'll know best if they're depressed or something's not right. And you want that check-in as a parent. And then I would say, I would leave the rest of it up to the kid. If the kid texts you, you could respond, but try to resist your impulse to get your nourishment from your kid, right? Let them develop their friendships. You should be having your friendships and your healthy adult relationships. So your kid is a part of your life, but not your everything. If that's the case, go get some therapy. It'll be very worthwhile. Let your kid have those delicious freedoms. Also, if your kid is constantly texting you from college, oh, I can't figure out my Ikea thing. You know, don't reply right away, sit on it or reply and say, oh, so sorry, I love you. Don't solve it. Don't jump, don't handle it. You need to empathize and empower signal. I'm so sorry you're dealing with this. Oh, that sounds frustrating. I love you. Pause. Maybe then say, let me know if there's anything I can do. I'm always here, but I'm confident you're going to figure this out. The I'm always here is like, I'm here in case you're falling off a cliff, not I'm here to be your concierge. Right. Because when we act that way, we undermine their skill building and then they do fall apart. And that's, that's definitely one of the contributors to the boomerang. Can't handle the first semester of college. Have not 
than expected to manage themselves through a day, let alone a week, let alone a semester. Mm -hmm. And they can't, and they come back to where it's cushiony and safe. And that feels loving, but we've undermined them. We've got to work at doing this loving, like, yep, you can do it. We're here, but you've got this. You've got this. Smile, nod, walk away. It's hard. Yeah. Believe me, I'm in it right now. I got a 21-year-old, 22. He just turned 22 yesterday. 22-year-old and a 19-year-old. I'm hard at work repatterning some of the ways in which I've encroached into their agency. I will acknowledge that. I do in all my books. And um, so I'm very much in it with folks trying to help us parents find the right distance, but there is a distance, mm -hmm. a healthy psychological distance. You're not your kid. They are making their way. They will stumble. That's normal. That's okay. You know, you're just trying to make sure the enormous stumbles that literally are life or death are things you're there to, to help prevent. Mm -hmm. Everything else is a life lesson worth learning. I am absorbing that like a sponge. I often will say to my daughter, I'm not your personal assistant, honey. <laughs> <laughs> got to do it on your own. Um, you know, we're running low on time. I feel like we could talk forever, but I, and, and I, you know, I wanted to talk about more about financial literacy and more about making the world better and more about what happens when there's disaster and um, uh, all of that. Um, so now everybody's just going to have to read the book and find out for themselves, which is what we want. But I'm just wondering if you could talk for a last question, if you could talk to your 22 or 20 or 18 year old self again, what advice would you give you? Yeah. Well, I was heading deeply into self-loathing then around my race, my identity. So I would say, Hey, just know that one day you're going to write a book about your experience as a black and biracial person and be in community with more people of color than you'd ever dreamed you would ever know, given that you grew up in all white places. I would give myself the Trevor project. It gets better message. Mm -hmm around my identity, number one. Number two, I would say, yes, Dan, him, yes. Whatever doubts you're having, him, yes. He will turn out to be the best thing that ever happened because he's going to roll over one day in bed in a pandemic. Yes, that's going to be a thing. And he's going to say, hey, baby, what can I do to make today easier for you? And he's going to mean it. Mm. And I would so reassure around whatever the 19, 20 year old me was like, well, you know, there's him and there's him. You know, I'd be like, mm, just let me just clear it up for you. And then I would say, you're going to make bad choices, but they're going to teach you everything you need to know about what matters to you. So the bad things turn out to lead to really good information. So it's okay. Mostly I would nod and smile at her and say, you're okay. You're okay, kid. You're okay. Trust me. You're okay. I love that. And then I would smile at her and walk away and wave my hand knowing that she would be like, holy shit, I just got a visit from my future self. That is freaking awesome. Like what? Good. I'd say I would have the wherewithal to believe what I'd said. I'm sorry. I now think it was a dream. <laughs> I just saw them. So I guess we won't have time to. I can quickly answer these. Lori Friedman says, would it be a good idea to have a year long class in high school about communication skills, finances, job careers? Yes. We've done away with home ec. We've done away with shop. We don't teach kids how to make things or break things or fix things or sew things or cook things. And we should, we've made it all about AP classes to the detriment of life skills. I'm highly in favor of these things. Um, does the book touch on the value of multi-generational households? I talk about the benefits and complexities. My next book is likely to be a memoir with my 82 year old mother in with whom I have lived in a multi-generational household now for 20 years. So I'm deeply interested in this subject. Follow me generally for more. Is suggesting college graduates set timelines for professional goals healthy or too pressure inducing? I think it should always be, kid, what are you interested in? What are you good at? How do you know? You know, so they can unearth through critical thinking why they're good at things, why they love things and just say like, that sounds awesome. Want to support you in just being more of that because that sounds like who you want to be. Um, so don't put yourself out there dangling. Do you want to go to med school, business school, law school? There are so many more options than that. There are an infinite set of options and those are three. Great answers. Mm -hmm. That was my spitball on the questions we got in the chat. I feel Thanks. like we should do that uh, moving forward with every author, like lightning round question. <laughs> um, that was great, both of you. I. I feel like I didn't oversell at the beginning when I said this was going to turn out to be one of the best pairings for Book Passage. 
Uh, you two are a natural fit. And um, I found myself taking notes um, for myself, mind you. <laughs> so thank you so much for the insightful conversation. And Peggy, great questions and follow, follow up. I love it. Um, just want to remind everybody that uh, both Peggy and Julie's books are staples at Book Passage, um, as is their presence, Peggy said, since the 90s. Um, so please do avail yourselves to their books um, uh, through Book Passage. We are now open, as we have been for many months now, in person, safely, uh, from 10 to 5, Monday, uh, Sunday through Sunday. I mean, we're just seven days a week, we're open. Um, and we're lively and we're, we've got it going on. Um, and if we don't have signed copies, these are Bay Area authors, I bet we could get some book plates going. Absolutely. Oh, good, good, good. Um, we're also available like everybody else online. Um, and we do appreciate your online orders, your phone orders. You'll get uh, the phone answered by very intelligent and enthused booksellers. And uh, so, yes, I recommend any and all of both their books through Book Passage. And uh, thank you for the lively conversation um, and insightful, informative. Um, also want to remind our audience, uh, Julie's going to be with us again. Uh, for a pro uh, the June Juneteenth Project event, uh, which is coming up Saturday at four o'clock. Uh, right now live, we have her uh, thoughtful reflection as well as uh, many other essays from other writers up on our website. We have a web page dedicated uh, to this Juneteenth Project. And then on Saturday at four o'clock Pacific time, we will have, um, actual oral presentations and Julie might actually come live to have kind of a controversial discussion. <laughs> uh, yeah, controversy. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you so much to our authors and thank you to our audience. We do appreciate you coming to these events and supporting Book Passage um, and supporting authors and in independent bookstores by buying their, their books. Thank you so much. Thank you.